Hello and welcome to Conversations on Sex, Addiction, and Relationships. So glad that you're here. I'm Tim Stein. Uh, with me are my Conversations crew, Wendy Conquest doing her thing in Colorado and helping people heal, Dan Drake heading up Banyan Therapy down in Los Angeles, and my clinical partner, uh, Jeannie Vitoni at Willow Tree Counseling. Uh, so glad that you're here. I have to say I'm laughing. This is like the fourth time that I've done this intro. I just could not get those words out of my mouth. But uh, we're so glad that you guys are here to join us today. Um, the format's a little different today than what we had done last time. We, just us four experts, are going to have a conversation and talk about, uh, today we're actually talking about uh, addictions in general. But before we hop into that, how are how are you guys doing? It's so good to see you as always. I love to spend spend my time talking with you. Great. I'm doing great. I'm in Boulder, Colorado, and we had a snowstorm. And so we've got about four inches on the ground and happy about that. So um, how about you guys? You're, you're in California. What's going on there? It's cool. It's crisp. I'd like to go outside. Sometime soon I'll be in my garden. Ooh, that sounds nice. nice. Mm -hmm. Got some planting projects this weekend. Oh, it's, it's sunny and nice. It is. It's sunny and nice out here. My son and I have uh, been getting out and doing some mountain biking. And so I'm at this place. I'm of an age where I'm old enough that I'm aware that I might hurt myself doing things, which I used to not feel. When you say um, might hurt yourself, is, that, is, that, is it maybe? Is it a might or is it a definite? No, 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 no. It's a, when. It, it's, it's not an it's, if. It's a when. It's a maybe. It's like there's a level of caution that I have mountain biking that I used to not have. <laughs> but there's a part of me that still wants to be that little kid on a bike just ripping around the mountain. So there's this uh, interesting uh, balance for me going out of my, my experience right now of reliving my childhood and being afraid to die. Wait, do you guys <laughs> have mountains in California? I didn't think you did. Well, we don't have Rocky Mountains, but we do have oh. mountains. Actually, I, what did I find out recently that Tahoe is actually higher than Denver, which I did not realize. Lake Tahoe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, Dan? I'm I'm good. I can't I can't complain. I, I don't even try to mountain bike these days. My joints don't hold up like they used to. So yeah. I'm afraid Dan, I'll you're fall. You're way too young for that. That's impossible. it's not. It every year it gets gets worse and worse. <laughs> the grades attest to that. <laughs> it's distinguished. I know. It's good. Silver We're all fox. Becoming huh? distinguished. Hopefully. That's the hopefully. Hope. It's wisdom, is what this is. That's that's what it is. Oh, I'll make sure I tell my kids that. Yeah. I'm gaining wisdom. They'll <laughs> laugh at me for that, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> so today we were trying to figure out what we were going to talk about, right? And um, we basically came up with the idea that um, a lot of people question uh, whether they're addicted or not, right? And a lot of people ask, well, can I be addicted to something like food or relationships or sex? So that's really what we wanted to launch into today and have a conversation about this. You know, I'm really glad we're talking about this because a lot of people do come in and they're like, I don't know if I'm addicted to or not. And again, I'm a sex addiction therapist and betrayal trauma therapist, but that, that's a big question for a lot of people. If I like porn, if I like doing this, you know, is that addiction? And where's the sex positive piece versus the addiction piece? It's really complicated. So for all the folks who are out there wondering this, I think, I think it's really helpful that we're hitting this topic today. Right. I like it as well. And I think that um, sometimes people jump to, um, oh, I, I bet he's addicted. Um, and then the person that is in question saying, wait, you know, I do these behaviors but I, I don't know if I'm addicted to them or not. So I get the question, well, so what's the difference? And if I am addicted, then what do I do? <clears throat> yeah, so what's your, what's your answer? What's the difference between addiction and maybe like a bad habit or uh, addiction and a behavior that I really, uh, really get into? Right, so there's an author, uh, Charlotte Castle, that I like a lot. And she talks uh, a lot about addiction, but specifically with, with women. Um, and she talks about uh, behaviors being um, habits, patterns, compulsions, and then addiction. And mm -hmm. I really like that because I think- um, Can you say those some, again? 
Yeah. So it's habits, mm -hmm. patterns, compulsions, and addiction. I think that really, that really, I'm thinking neurology, and I don't know what you guys think about this, but for me, that is the continuum of the neurological processes, that this is an occasional behavior, and then on the path of it becoming a coping skill, and then a neurological pathway, and then an addicted pathway. I think there is a difference. So I'm really curious to learn more about this gal. But do you guys see that spectrum also when you're sort of assessing? Yeah, but I think we have to look at, I mean, even slowing it down, how, how, what is the difference between addiction and compulsion, right? Like how, it, Wendy, for what you're reading, how would you differentiate those two things? Right, so a compulsion is something that someone does, but they still have control of it. So um, they, they can see themselves doing the behavior. And then if they say, oh, you know, this is not a good idea, they can stop. Where Castle makes the distinction, and, and I agree that when it becomes addiction, you can have every intention in the world to stop, and you can't. All of a sudden, you know, you, you find yourself doing it again. And even though you've put in, so, you know, people who are addicted to porn, you know, even though they put in uh, uh, porn blockers on their phones, even though they have, you know, put the computer in the living room, even though they still find ways um, it, and it and becomes, uh, it, they're not even thinking about it anymore. There, there's not an obvious thought process. It's just the behavior happens. And all of a sudden they find themselves doing what they promised their partners themselves that they would never do. That's a huge phrase that all of a sudden, I hear that a lot. You know, I was doing this and this and this, and then all of a sudden I found myself doing this. Mm -hmm. I think our job is to slow that down. It didn't usually just happen all of a sudden. There's a lot that actually does go on before you start to engage in these things. But mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a huge thing I hear all the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know for you guys, but a lot of clients, that I talk to, they'll set dates. They're going to stop doing it. You know, they'll, 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 they don't want to be doing the behaviors. I think that's the difference. We're not saying certain behaviors are bad or right or wrong necessarily. We're just saying someone they're, they're causing problems for that person and they want to stop them. They're not able to. So they'll new year's as an example, you know, set a new year's resolution. I'll, I won't do this or that, or a birthday or an anniversary, you know, the kid's birthday. I hear that a lot too. You know, I'll, I'll set, this is the date that I'm going to stop. Uh, and then lo and behold, they're not able to keep that, uh, that commitment to themselves or to the relationship. Hey, well, and what I, what I find a lot as well is that, um, right before the date that they promise they're going to stop with, with addiction, there's this, uh, uh, almost like a, a, a purging or a, a big acting out, um, episode that could be with alcoholics. They go on this binge and then, and then they're going to stop. Um, like Mardi Gras? So, yeah, like Mardi Gras, exactly, before Lent, it's true. Um, so uh, the, I think that's an interesting component. Um, I would, um, <clears throat> I also want to put in, because some people will come in and they'll say, well, I stopped, I did stop for a couple of years, right. and now it's back. And I, and I talk about that as sort of an on-off pattern. And so, you know, is that addiction? Is it not? And my answer would be says sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. You have to look deeper. But I was actually going to say, hey, Tim, there was um, this research article that we read a long time ago and we talk about sometimes about being a race car going through the intersection oh, yeah. or being the big truck. Would you mind sharing that one? Because I yeah. think that's really helpful just to talk. It, it shows the neurological um, process but in a really great little story yeah it it comes out of the the neurological research on on addictions and the neurological impact that addictions have on the brain because when we really dig into what is an addiction and i love that the i think it was the american medical association finally changed their definition of addiction from being a behavioral problematic behavior disorder to a neurological brain problem but two of the areas of the brain that get impacted in neurology by addictions are the area of our brain that sort of controls our focus and what we're, what we're drawn to, as well as the part of our brain that acts as a container and, and sort of is a braking system. And so 
a, 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 a normal non-addict individual, uh, you know, a civilian from 12-step lingo, is able to navigate through their life <clears throat> pretty easily. You know, they, 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 they feel like they're in a sports car and in reality, their brain is functioning like a sports car. You know, they're able to recognize that there's a turn coming up in their life and they're able to sort of like take that turn. They recognize that they're focused on something and they can recognize that that's their focus, but not be overly drawn to it, that they, that they can't uh, veer their, their, you know, change their direction if they need to, but they can recognize that, hey, that there's a, there's a line here with my behavior that if I cross, it's going to be problematic and they're able to stop themselves and contain themselves before they get there. When there's an addiction pattern that's been going on that has neurologically impacted their brain, their ability to, can, to um, uh, direct their focus is impacted. And so they are hyper drawn to those addictive uh, triggers, addictive stimuli, uh, whatever it is that's, that, that, that's pulling them, they're hyper drawn to that and they have a much diffi more difficult time pulling themselves away. And they see, oh, here's that line that I know that if I cross this line, it's problematic. And they consistently shoot, overshoot that line because that part of their brain that contains and um, uh, is a breaking system for their behavior is impacted. And so when I talk about this with clients, you know, I say, you think your brain is a sports car and you're gonna be able to corner just fine and hit the brakes and stop on a dime. And what you haven't accepted yet is that with your brain being impacted by addictive behaviors the way it has been, your brain is actually a loaded moving van. And so you're gonna to try to take this corner, but you're not gonna take the corner effectively. You're gonna sort of like go way out and into the other lane and, and maybe tip the thing over. You know, you're gonna see the stoplight up there and you're gonna hit the brakes thinking you can stop on a dime, but that moving van is gonna carry its momentum and you're gonna well overshoot that, that, that stopping line and you're gonna end up out in the middle of the intersection. And so, you know, for me, th there is this piece of, is it an addiction or is it not an addiction? Well, how hyper drawn are you to whatever the stimulation is and how effective are you at actually being able to contain your behavior? And, you know, like, like, uh, like you were saying, Wendy, uh, how much of that is something that I'm able to manage and control on my own? And how much of that is unmanageable? You know, I think about the, the first step of the 12 steps, you know, I'm powerless over this addiction and my life's become unmanageable. I can't, no matter how much I want to, you know, uh, direct my focus and attention where I would like it to be. And I can't stop myself consistently in a way that would be helpful. The story that's coming to mind for me, I'm just going to keep going here. The story that comes to mind for me is... When I was in high school, one of, I would love to say my one bad habit, but one of my bad habits was that I tended to, to bite my nails. And it, and, and it was, you know, I, it was a little bit painful and problematic. And eventually the solution for me was I put some nail clippers on my keychain. And when I went to bite my, my nails, I would just pull the nail clippers out and I would just clip my nails and take care of it. And it wasn't an issue. If somebody's got an addiction, having nail clippers on their keychain isn't going to stop the behavior because it, it's, it, it's going to go in a different way. You know, it, even if, you know, how many times have we heard in our work, you know, someone saying, well, if my wife would just have sex with me, if, if, if they would just do this, then I would stop. And we all know that when somebody has got an addiction, that doesn't stop it mm -hmm. because the behavior is, is they're being drawn to a stimulation and it's outside of their control and they're unable to actually contain themselves and stop themselves. So. Yeah, I, I like thinking, I just, I need simplicity. So for me, I boil it down to three things, right? You talked about, we talked about loss of control as one of them earlier, right? So to me, number one is loss of control. Number two is what you're talking about, right? Is the, Tim was the obsession and preoccupation. Yep. And then I think the third is continuation despite negative consequences. So when you boil down, and I think that's any addiction. I don't know if you guys would all agree, but we could talk sex, we could talk alcohol, but I like, you know, differentiating out uh, chemical versus process addiction. Sometimes we, we like to differentiate that. 
one way that, you know, chemicals are some things I'm ingesting into my body. Right. But then I find looking at processes, like one thing that it's a lot of research is in gambling. So I, I find if we can accept gambling as a process addiction, it's not something I'm ingesting. It's something that I'm addicted to doing. There's a lot of research on this as being problematic and be, being addictive. I don't think people would say there's nothing addictive about gambling, right? I think we, we know that it can be and it can be destructive. So, you know, how many times do people, you chase more good money after bad or you spend your kid's college tuition or something? Those are the negative consequences. And then they still keep going back and they're, you know, in debt. And, and that's the thing I think with any addiction you, you could do. Unfortunately, when it comes to sex, there's there could be the same consequences. Spending a bunch of money could be legal consequences sometimes, could be financial consequences. And certainly there's the impact if, if someone's partner impact on the, the, the relationship and on the partner and the family. So I think with sex, it's so deeply personal and relational. That's what makes this so, so much trickier to navigate. Do you guys, do you guys all see that? Yeah, one of the big differences I talk about is um, in the sex addiction pieces, impact on partner because it really contains a lot of uh, lies about what's really going on. It's harder to lie if you're under the influence of alcohol or drugs. There's a lot of visible signs. Mm -hmm. Someone's slurring their words, someone's kind of stumbling around, someone's chattering their teeth. But with sex addiction, a partner or family member can't really see that as well. And so it's super confusing of whether the sex addict is high in that moment or not. Is he just in a bad mood? Is she, is she just feeling irritable today or is something else going on, but you can't see it. So I feel like the level of destruction in the attachment, in the trust, in the relationship is much different than chemical substance um, addictions. Yeah. Do you guys find that too? Yeah, I've heard, I've had uh, definitely um, partners say, um, boy, if, if he was an alcoholic, I would be upset or disappointed but I would so take uh, that over him or her being sexually addicted. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the chemical addictions, even though it, it, there's a lot, there's lying that happens with those as well. It, it isn't, as we've been saying, it's not as personal as uh, sex addiction is. And um, I'm just gonna throw in here that um, what I found is it doesn't matter whether it's virtual or uh, in the industry where we say crossing the flesh line, right? It, it doesn't matter whether it's virtual or whether someone has actually had sex with a person, the level of trauma is the same for the partners. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, I, when I first started working with partners and doing groups, I was curious if there would be a difference in the traumatic ex uh, experience and there's none, it's, it's exactly the same. I did want to ask Tim a question um, with the piece around the neurological piece. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess all of you, there, so there's this, um, this, this theory, this idea that addiction is caused by trauma. Mm -hmm. And a lot of partners of sex addicts really don't want to hear this. They, they don't want to um, think that the sex addiction is caused by uh, trauma from the past, that somehow it um, minimalizes the behavior and minimalizes the, mm -hmm. the um, responsibility. I'm just curious what you, what you think about that. I am a big advocate that trauma is at the core of, uh, of most addictions, if not all addictions. Um, and I don't see it as minimizing. I, I guess my answer to that is anybody who spent any time in a 12 step meeting, I hope that they've gotten very clearly that just acknowledging that you're an addict and that your behavior is out of control and regardless of what caused it does not make anybody not responsible or accountable for what they've done. You know, I, I will sometimes talk with, uh, with, with, with the addicts that I work with that recovery is about walking in the middle of paradoxes and paradoxes is, you know, holding two opposite ideas is equally true simultaneously. And one of the paradoxes that in recovery, we constantly have to walk is on one side, I am absolutely responsible for the impact of my addiction and my behaviors. 
And that responsibility will never be taken away from me and it will always be in my way. The other side of that is I'm actively living my life in a different way so that I'm no longer that person and I'm not defined by my addictive behaviors anymore. We have to hold both of those simultaneously and recognizing that I'm doing this work does not take away the responsibility. Recognizing that I'm accountable and responsible for what I've done does not take away that I'm living my life in a different way and doing something different. But back to the question about trauma, my belief, and I don't know that there's formal research on this, but my experiential clinical belief is that, that addictive urges come in, in two different ways. I see sort of the trauma, the trauma pattern, which is I've experienced trauma in my background. I have wounds that get triggered, that bring up that trauma reaction. What we know about trauma neurologically is when I, my trauma reaction is, is set off is that my frontal lobe goes dark and my survival brain takes over. And over the years, because behavior impacts our neurology and our neurology impacts our behavior, it becomes that neuroplastic uh, reprogramming cycle where our brain influences behavior and behavior influences our brain. Over the years, my brain, my survival brain learned, if I go to this behavior, it helps me to survive this perceived trauma experience. So I had trauma as a child. At some point I learned that uh, masturbation or uh, thrill seeking and gambling or food by either eating or by controlling. Uh, helped me to sort of feel more in control or to, to, uh, to soothe my anxiety or to just help me feel more, uh, more grounded. And over the years, as I unconsciously went to that behavior to ground myself, my brain learned to use that as a coping mechanism. And now when I have a trauma reaction and my brain goes offline and my survival brain takes over, it pulls me into my addiction as an unconscious survival tool to manage the trauma reaction. The other pattern that I see is more of a Pavlovian response. And, and with sex addiction, I think about uh, the men that we see in their early 20s that don't have obvious trauma in their background, but their primary sexual experience from a very early teenage years was online. And, through repeated, um, through repeated connection of sexuality in the computer and the computer and sexuality and the orgasm that their brain started to fuse those patterns together. And so there's a Pavlovian response of, you know, I have this stimu stimuli and my brain overshoots all the in-between steps that used to be there and just goes to the end point. Just like, you know, Pavlov's dogs learn to salivate when there was a bell and they bypassed the food piece in the middle. So there's this neurological piece that's driving the addictive behaviors, whether that neurological piece was originally set in motion and has continued to be driven by a trauma response or whether it's driven by Pavlovian response. And regardless of where that neurological stuff comes from, I think it's really important to recognize that none of that means that the person who is doing the addictive behaviors isn't responsible for their behaviors and for the impact of their behaviors on other people. Thank you, Tim, for talking about the trauma piece and the neurological piece and, and sharing more about where that comes from and how it shows up. I do want to get back to something Dan said earlier about, you know, three criteria and the criteria of what is an addiction. And I think this is an important piece where we're using the same criteria no matter what the substance is, at least that's what we do is, you know, no matter if it's sex, food, gambling, um, those are what we call the process addictions, the behavior addictions, it's the same criteria. And so Dan, can you repeat yours? I know that I would say things a bit differently, but I'm really curious if mine would blend into yours and yours, you've sort of generalized. Well, that's an interesting discussion, isn't it? How do yeah. we all define it? Because I don't think there's one, one way this has to be defined. I, I think of the first thing being loss of control. So that means 
tolerance, withdrawal. I need more and more of that activity, or even if it's a substance, I need more and more of that thing to get the same effect. I may engage in things for longer periods of time. There may be more intensity that I'm seeking to get the same effect, um, but I'm losing control over it that I, at some point I'm, I'm not able to stop. I've, I've repeated attempts to stop, but I'm not able to. So to me, that's loss of control would be the first thing. Second would be uh, preoccupation or obsession so that I'm consumed with this. This is what you're talking about, Tim. You know, my, I'm, I'm kind of drawn to it maybe differently than a normie might. Um, and then the third would be continuation despite negative consequences. Okay, because when you had that first one, that loss of control, some of the things I'm looking for are failed efforts to stop. I've tried to stop. I've thrown the magazines away. I, I don't go down to those bars anymore. Um, you know, I, I've locked up my account so I can't get access to them, but then I do, you know, so, so those failed efforts to stop. And then you talked about the escalation, you know, this, this, this to get the same effect. I call it the one beer, two beer. Now we're at six pack and we're going for a fifth to get the same effect. So you're putting tolerance and escalation mm -hmm. under loss of control. Okay. Yeah, I know this. Uh, in some of the inventories we do, there's 10 criteria. My brain can't remember 10 criteria, so I put them into three. Mm -hmm. But I, mm -hmm. when I think about that, I think it's important because that 10 criteria, we initially brought that over from alcohol and drug addiction. And so when we look at the criteria for is something ad ad addictive from that criteria perspective, we use the same criteria for is something a chemical addiction? Is it a gambling addiction? Is it an eating addiction? Is it a sexual addiction? We use the same criteria. And, mm -hmm. and it brings up that question of can a process be addictive, you know, and, and can it be out of control? I think about a client of mine who, if he went to the gas station, he had to pay at the pump because if he walked into the building to pay, he was unable to leave without a minimum of five scratchers. You know, and also uh, people who have an eating disorder, you know, they know that they should get X number of calories, but they just can't bring themselves to do it. They know that they maybe shouldn't have, you know, uh, a second dessert or they shouldn't grab the entire pint of Ben and Jerry's and they can't stop themselves. And so that, that, that if it, even if it's a process addiction, that sense of it's out of control and I've lost control. And so for me, when I think about that, it's like obvious for me that, well, of course, a process, a behavior can be addictive, even though it isn't a chemical. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle around to Dan's third criteria, because what we've been talking about is the person identifying for themselves that they're out of control. And so, so many times the person will say, no, I'm not out of control. No, this is, I just did it a few times, right? So a minimalization or a justification will happen. And so uh, many, many times this um, consequences in their life. So major relationships or friendships or uh, things happening at work is the, is the red light that comes on to say, hey, something's wrong. And sometimes it's, it's really, I'm sure you, we've all experienced this, is it's very difficult to convince the addict. I, I love the analogy that you made, Tim, of that, of, of the race car, right, being in control, and then the truck being completely out of control. And, you know, does that truck driver say, whoa, I took that turn a little too wide? Um, can they recognize that? Or is it um, not until they've actually hit a tree that they say, oh, maybe something's wrong. But if the person in the truck riding with them they might be the one to be noticing, oh, wow, this, this guy is taking these turns way too wide. I love that you're pointing this out, Wendy, because yeah. so many times an active addict does not see their behavior as incongruent or problematic. They think it's under control and all those things. And, and really the family unit, the friend unit around them is going, whoa, that doesn't look so good. We need to get, I mean, think about interventions and Folks all the time see this on TV portrayed, but it's the people around who say, there's a problem here. And one of the, and now I'm gonna go into the sex addiction piece. Sex addiction is so hidden and so isolated and so secretive that the people around the addict aren't really sure what's going on because they're not finding bottles. They're not missing money. They're, you know, they're not, it's not as obvious. And so 
that's really hard also is this part of just my sexual health or is this addictive so i'm so glad I, that you pointed out that piece about the family unit the partner unit the fa- friend unit around that act of addiction so i'm sorry to interrupt but that i just no, no, was really important okay. for me no, that it, it, yeah thank you um and i think another big piece of this that that um family members struggle with is well when do i when and how do i confront the person um, do I confront them? Or certainly, um, I've heard the story of partners that say, boy, you know, I was, you know, on her for years to look at her behavior and she just wouldn't or said that I was the crazy one, that I was jealous. Um, and so I, I just kept doing what I was doing because I didn't see any harm in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it makes me think you have, we have the partner or a significant other that may have one experience, but, you know, and it may be different with other addictions, but given that sex addiction, for example, is so hidden, a lot of times sex addicts will portray themselves a certain way to their family or to their communities. So, you know, maybe the partner has one sense of this person, but then everybody else get got to know a different person they don't see what's underneath all that so they, they portray themselves as the pillar of the community charming or very you know successful and and a nice guy or something and and yet that's not what the partner's experiencing through the betrayal so sometimes when this comes out I mean I, I don't know what you would all say but this becomes another wave of trauma for partners of of addicts particularly sex addicts that they you know they say this is what my my significant other is doing and it's it's terrible and it's it's really harmful to me and yet everyone's like no 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 that they would never do that that's this that can't be that person that's not that's not them so this happens all the time right do you guys experience that too Mm -hmm. yeah which is another layer of trauma and betrayal because here the partner's been betrayed by their relationship partner and then the community doesn't see the experience or recognize the experience or minimizes the experience so that's another level, layer of betrayal by their community, community people. So it really leaves the betrayed partner feeling so isolated. Yeah, because he's such a nice guy. I'm sure he didn't mean it like that. I'm sure that didn't happen the way you're saying. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, so for our audience today, this piece around, um, and we, we, and I think we we're, we're clarifying uh, uh, chemical addictions versus what we're calling process addictions, which are behaviorals. It's it's pretty much the same dynamic going uh, going on. And uh, my thought is that the diagnostic uh, manual will have this probably in the next five years um, uh, that that we'll be really seeing this as. Um, well, it's in the it's in the works in the international the ICD International Handbook of Diagnosis mm-hmm. as an impulse disorder to be explored and understood what what it really is at least for sex addiction which is the same pathway that gambling addiction took so I too right. expect that it's going to be in the American Diagnostic the DSM here within the within five years or so but. Right. So, so the question is, is today. I want to explain to our listeners, when we talk about the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the DSM, a lot of folks probably don't know what that is. So let me just jump in here and say, that's basically the book of diagnosis titles and, and explanations of what causes those diagnoses and treatment of those diagnoses. And so it's a, it's a, it's a summarization and it's what the United States uses. I think the, the rest of the world uses the ICD, which is the sort of the precursor of getting into our DSM, but all mental health professionals use diagnoses. They're included in the DSM, uh, which is updated every few years. Thank you, thanks. So for our listeners today, let's say we have either, well, maybe we do each individually, but if we have someone who thinks that they're addicted, how do they determine right? What, and what do they do next? And then if we have someone that's a partner that's listening and says, boy, you know, I want to confront them. um, But, you know, what do I do? Maybe those are two different parts of the conversation. Mm -hmm. The first one is, is if I think I'm addicted, what, what do I do? How do I know? Mm -hmm. Do I go to a psychiatrist? I hear this a lot. Well, maybe I need to go to a psychiatrist to figure this out. Um, maybe there's a, a medication or a pill that I can take. 
Um, I work with a lot of people internationally and, and they, they will ask, isn't there just a pill? Can't I just take a pill? It's like, well, no, we don't have that quite yet. <laughs> um, so what do we, what do we say to these folks? Well, there are some medications that can help with urge reduction if there's an addiction going on, which is cool. But I, you know, as far as I think I'm an addict, what do I do? We live in an amazing age of information dissemination right now. And so the, the first thing, if you think that there's an addiction, go online. And, and, and there are all kinds of self-assessments for, am I a gambling addict? Am I a sex addict? Do I have an eating disorder? You know, and, and, and start doing a little bit of research and, and, and see if those uh, self-assessments or the, the things that people are describing when they talk about their experiences match your experience or match your perception of what's going on for you. The second thing about, do I go see a psychiatrist? And I think that this is something that you gotta be careful with. I absolutely think it's, it's helpful to go see a therapist, a psychiatrist, a psychologist to help you figure out, is this truly an addiction? I would also be careful to make sure that I was going to a specialist in that specific addictive realm. I don't do eating disorders and alcohol addiction, and I can give people you know, uh, uh, an informed idea of whether I think there's something really going on, but I'm not really competent to tell someone whether they have an eating disorder or an alcohol addiction. And in sex addiction, unfortunately, I've had way too many people that have talked to other therapists that don't know this field. And I look at them and say, wow, this is clearly out of control, clearly problematic. There's lots of consequences coming your way. You haven't been able to stop. Um, and, and, and there's a lots of preoccupation going on. And their therapist says, well, you know, people are sexual and, you know, you just need to open up your, your mind a little bit more and be, be comfortable. And it's not about you know, sexual mores, it's about the underlying pattern that's going on with that behavior. So absolutely go, go see a specialist uh, to get more information, but make sure that you're seeing a specialist who's a specialist in the area you think there might be addiction going on with, whether that's food, gambling, sex, uh, or alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is is see, go to, go to therapist or specialist, but make sure they're a specialist in the area that you're looking for. So if you're concerned that you have food addiction, go to a food addiction specialist. If you're concerned about alcohol, chemical, sex, gambling, go to a specialist who has expertise in that. Because sadly, people will make mistakes if they're not well-versed. If you come to me for chemical dependency, I'm not your girl. I could, like Tim, I can talk about it, but really I'm going to refer you because in our world, we call it out of scope. It's out of my scope of practice. It's not what I'm specially trained in. So go to a specialist. Is there any piece that you would add, Dan? Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, I was, that's exactly what I was thinking, but I was, um, the one thing I would add, and I, I like to look at, at medical examples sometimes, like if I've got something going on with my brain, you know, if something's wrong neurologically, or I think something, something, I've got these massive headaches or something, and I don't, something's wrong. I'm probably not going to go to my general practitioner. I really want to find a specialist because that person will help me know, have a better sense of what's going on in our brain. And I think all of us are specialized in sex addictions, particularly, but I thought, you know, I think that's helpful to look at what, what you, you want to look at someone who knows, because I don't know for you all, but I had one two quarter, uh, sorry, two unit class in my, my quarter system for, for grad school on addiction. One, yeah. one little class. Did you guys yeah. have, I mean, I don't know about your programs, maybe, maybe yeah. one class. One class. I, I had, I had one class and it only talked about chemical and drug addiction. Mm -hmm. Well, one class isn't quite enough. So there's therapists, you know, we know, we know stuff. We, we'd learn a lot, but I, I mean, I've had that one little two unit class about addiction, but I've had whatever, you know, hundreds of hours of training and thousands of hours of specialized experience in this one area. And, you know, I wouldn't pretend to think that I, I know everything, but I, I'm, I'm clear in this one area. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really, really good point because mm -hmm. at least for me, if I didn't know better, I would say this therapist or psychiatrist or psychologist would, you know, they, they're well-trained, of course they are, 
and that they would be able to help. And they may be able to help, but you really want someone who, who knows their stuff, who's specialized in this area, whatever the area might be. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and I also want to um, bring in that for partners, there's specialized treatment um, regarding what we call betrayal trauma. And that's not a part of that we're focusing in on, on this discussion. My thought is, is that soon we'll dedicate um, a, a, a video to partners specifically and what it's like if you think that you're in a relationship with an addict and then what to do and what to do for yourself around that. Well, that, I, I love this conversation. It, it, it's really, I found it really fascinating and interesting just sort of exploring process addictions versus chemical addictions. What are they? Can they actually be addictive? And, and uh, you know, for all of you out there listening to us, I hope you found this not only interesting and perhaps a bit entertaining, but informative as well. And uh, we, as always, just want to thank you for joining the conversation with us. Um, be sure to rate us on Spotify or YouTube or wherever you're, you're, you're get listening to us. And uh, we'll see you in the future. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone.